This podcast is brought to you by SciFi, the world leader in psychology fitness training. SciFi is scientifically proven to help you optimize your physical, mental, and emotional performance through functional training of your brain, body, and breath. For the first time, have your own clinical psychologist, personal trainer, life coach, breathwork teacher, and mediation instructor all in one. Instead of having to wait months or even years for results, you get them in 75 minutes or less. That's the sci-fi difference. Rewire your brain, retrain your body, and refocus your breath. Learn more at psyfi.nyc. It's been said, you, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. In the ring, I control my own destiny. I win, I win, I lose, I lose. It's in my hands. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. I face life head on, but I've learned to welcome the challenges even in the ring. From the boxing side of it, every time we fall, we get back up. That's what Life's Tough, Boxers Are Tougher is all about. The guest corner comes to us from Brooklyn, New York, by way of Odessa, Ukraine. His record, an outstanding one. 35 victories against only two defeats with 18 big wins coming by way of a knockout. He has also promoted 54 events and represents some of the most exciting fighters in the world today. Please welcome the former IBF International, the WBA International, and the WBF Junior Welterweight World Champion, the star of David, Dimitri Salida. Thank you. You made me feel like I'm getting ready for a fight. That's the that's the goal, right? That's the goal. I'm a, so look, th- consider this my audition. I want to uh, I want to announce for uh, Salida, pro- you know, uh, promotions at some point. Hi. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much, bud. I really appreciate you doing this. I know you had a busy schedule. Um, so how you doing? What are you What are you up to? Tell catch us up. What do, uh, What's some stuff going on for you? I'm doing great. It's, it's a busy week. Next week we have a tremendous show here in Detroit, August 10th, Detroit Brawl, which is part of our series. World Radio Show, Jakarta Gashi is going to be in the main event. The main event is going to be for the USB Light Heavyweight World Title. Ali Ismailov, Light Heavyweight Contender, who I'm very excited about. We'll, we have nine fights, all in all, international, local, and national talent at the Garden Theater in Detroit City. Very rich city with a boxing history. Uh, that's going to be August 10th. and September 10th, we have the biggest fight in women's boxing history. We're Clarissa Shields going to fight Savannah Marshall for the Undisputed yeah. Titles. So that's the immediate future. And October, November, working on uh, fights for uh, some of our other fighters, including Joel Miller, Otto Whalen, and the rest of the roster. How's it, how's it going for Miller? It's going good. He's had two fights in two months, working his way back slowly but surely, improving with each fight. In the second fight, he weighed in uh, about 14, 15 pounds lighter than he did for the first fight, scored a knockout, which is good. So staying busy, we're working on, on a... Uh, on a uh, comeback, another comeback fight for him in September, where they take another step up, and hopefully after that, before the end of the year, he'll be ready for a big one. Yeah, good, good. You know, I, I know it's it's been a tough, uh, some tough sledding for him, and uh, I, I, you know, I've met him twice. That's how actually I met you, and uh, you know, he he's he's a great guy. I feel bad that he kind of got jammed up, and uh, you know, like I said, he's a great guy. He represents the sport well. It was just a, you know, just. I feel bad that it went as badly for him as it did, but uh, it's good that he's got a good guy like you in his corner, uh, keeping him keeping him moving. As you have in the back of your life's tough, boxes are tougher. Yeah, absolutely. So we, all, we all hit some pitfalls and some challenges, and uh, and it's up to us to overcome them in the best, most productive kind of way. So I really believe that Jarrell learned his lessons and is working hard, and hopefully will have a chance to get the reward that he worked so hard for throughout his whole life. And uh, now, now that he's clean and, and, and I'm really hoping that he'll stay that way and we'll have an opportunity to, 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 uh, to make a name for himself and to fight for the heavyweight world title once again. Excellent. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep a good thought for you guys. Oh, and then, uh, you know, you're running around, right? Are you in, are you in Detroit or are you in New York? I am in Detroit currently. Okay. All right. Do you, now do you live there or you live here? When you say here, where is here? Oh, New, uh, New York. Sorry. <laughs> um, I live in Michigan. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Well, I, I know you. I know you. You grew up around here, so well around New York. So. Yep. Yeah. The. Uh, New York City. It, hey, you first announced me. Brooklyn, New York. 
both difficult, challenging, could be challenging places to grow up in, uh, both in their own ways. So, uh, and Michigan is a little bit calmer. <laughs> <laughs> Michigan's a little bit calmer than than uh, New York. All right, I'm going to take you at your word on that one, my friend. Uh, Not the, very good, but the suburbs are. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Um, well, look, we say life's tough. Boxes are tougher. You pointed it out on my sign. Um, so tell us why you are tougher than life. I'm taking it one day at a time. I don't know yet that I'm tougher than life. I'm trying to make it. I'm, I feel that I'm still young and taking the day at a time. And hopefully, hopefully at the end, at the end of the day, which will hopefully is a, is, is a significant time in the future, uh, I'll be able to, to, uh, to say, to say and hopefully hopefully life becomes sweet it's a tough at points but <laughs> sweet so we have to make it sweet i think we have to do our best to make it sweet and as you have on the bottom of life's tough box the tougher share the love so i think yeah. sharing um if you focus on sharing the love i believe that the toughness makes the toughness a little bit easier and um and makes it pleasant for for yourself and for those around you yeah well said and uh well spoken um now you uh, immigrated here from uh, Ukraine. How are how are you feeling now? I mean, obviously, it's a very tough world right now for Ukraine. So I immigrated here. Actually, was still part of the Soviet Union when I came here. <clears throat> My family immigrated to the United States because of lack of opportunities and kind of second class treatment of of, uh, of the Jewish population. And my parents felt that that myself and my my older brother Michael will have better opportunities for, for education and for whatever we choose in life in the United States. So that was the reason why we came here in 1991. Obviously, immigration is a challenging process and it's probably one of the reasons why I joined Star City Boxing Club when I was 13 years old and use the energy that's caused by the frustration and challenges of immigration to, uh, to make myself the best boxer that I could be. Um, and uh, it's obviously a very challenging time. I really believe for both sides for, uh, you know, because the Ukrainians and the Russians are kind of, you know, many of them are related, intermarried, cousins, brothers, uncles, aunts. So it's a very challenging situation. And I really feel compassionate towards civilians on both sides that have to go through this, through this very challenging time. Yeah, it's been a rough go, and we've had some. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, Ukrainian fighters on as well, and uh, they're they're recent, more recent, uh, immigrated, and you know still have family there. So it's just a. It's been a, you know, it's just a. It's a tragic situation. I mean, there's nothing else you can say about it other than that. Um, talk to us a little bit about the process. I mean, you go from the Soviet Union, right? The the Iron Curtain and you come to America and you wind up uh, in Brooklyn. You know, tell us, tell us about that and, and how that went. Well, <clears throat> Brooklyn certainly has a different culture, <laughs> different culture than the Soviet Union. I remember we moved to King's Highway, King's Highway 27, between 27 and 28th Street. And the corner of King's Highway and Ocean Avenue, there was a wall bombs. And um, when we walked into the wall bombs, we, we arrived in December, December 21st, 1991. I remember walking into the wall bombs and seeing fruits and vegetables in the wintertime. And that's something that I've never seen before in my life. And uh, things that I myself take for granted now because I got so used to it. But growing up in the Soviet Union, the only thing that we had in the winter was sometimes cucumbers and potatoes. So didn't have the, the, um, uh, the selection of foods and vegetables, fruits, uh, and uh, Coca-Cola and ice cream and all kinds of things uh, that we see here in supermarkets. It's, the culture certainly was different. You know, going to school, different language, different clothes was obviously challenging. But, um, you know, step by step, you acclimate to the environment and, um, and, and uh, try to make a better life for yourself. The, the Soviet Union, um, obviously, now you, I know you didn't box over on that side, right? So you didn't box when you were on the other side. Um, and they're, you know, they had a, a pretty rough history, Russia especially, but they've had a pretty rough, rough history of, you know, with the pogroms and and the and the treatment of uh, the Jewish population. Um, you, you had mentioned your father had said that, like, 
you know, what, what was, how hard was that dealing with that? And what kind of prejudice did you see there? Well, it was challenging. You know, I was only nine years old, so I was a very young kid when, um, when we came here, but I certainly heard my parents and my relatives and our neighbors, people talk about it and experience hardships. One time when I was in second grade, you know, a kid called me a, a shit, which is a derogatory name for a Jew, you know, and, uh, and I got, and because of that, I got into a fight with him and then my parents got called to, uh, to sort it out. But, and that kid, and the kid was my friend really. So, you know, um, and, you know, that kind of language was acceptable. So I'm certainly not being in the United States and uh, sensitive, certainly grow, growing up in a boxing community where ironically, I was also the minority <laughs> um, in many ways, but sensitive to, you know, to, to, to social justice and to uh, different initiatives that happen, that happen in the United States now. I do believe that America is the best country in the world. And I'm very grateful for this land of opportunity. I came here with nothing. When, uh, my family was on welfare and food stamps. And eventually my father got a job at the MTA and uh, made a living. Um, and uh, I joined Starry City Boxing Club and was able to win some incredible tournaments, win the U.S. Nationals. Gold gloves too, right? Won the golden gloves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and, you know, got a chance to fight on television and be interviewed. And I'm, I'm now interviewed by you. Uh, so I'm very grateful for this land of opportunity that gave me the ability to be able to, to achieve, um, you know, many of my goals. And that through hard work and determination and uh, uh, God's blessing, you're able to, to, to make something of yourself. So I'm very grateful for that. Every day, of my, every morning. That's... Uh... That's inspiring for sure. And I think that's, I think it's a great point. And, you know, uh, <laughs> I heard somebody one time say that, uh, and it was somebody who also immigrated. They said, uh, America is the worst country in the world, except for every other one. So, um, you know, and it, it's the truth. It's a, it's a great country and it, and it actually works, uh, if you, if you work with it and, um, you know, yeah. So you you get in and so so you stumbled into the boxing gym. I imagine that had something to do with uh, getting in some kind of fights uh, right. as a kid. I sorry. I just want to say one thing about about what the American what, America, what being in the United States means to me. So we arrived in New York City. New York City has people from all over the world, all different kinds of from every place in the world. And eventually, you can be called an American, and that's a big thing. That's a big deal. You're an American. You're just like everybody else. Uh, and you can get your green card and then you can get your passport and you pay your taxes and you're a real part of society. And that's really incredible. And, um, you know, we all have to be able to, there's always room for improvement and, and we as society have to work to get better and, and to make life better for ourselves and for our children and future generations. But the foundationally, I, I really believe that, uh, that there's a lot of great things. And, I'm, and again, I'm very grateful to, to, to be here uh, in these United States. And one of the things that I left out, uh, which was an incredible honor, years after boxing, I got invited to meet the president three times. I met President Bush twice and I met President Obama. And for me, who was an immigrant who, you know, again, from welfare and food stamps to really being able to meet the highest person in the country is really incredible and a great honor and, uh, you know, shows what is possible. Uh, and what I'm very grateful for. All right, so listen, we got we got to we got to jump off the script now, and we got to ask about that. So tell tell us about meeting uh, President Bush and President Obama. We definitely got to hear that story. So um, I got invited to meet President Bush in 2004 and 2005, and I got invited to meet President Obama in 2010. Um, President Bush was in December. President Obama was in, was in May. Both incredibly, incredible experiences for me. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, first time that I went to meet President Bush was in 2004, I took Jimmy O'Farrell. Jimmy O'Farrell uh, was the head of Sarah City Boxing Club, someone who really, you know, adopted me in, in, in a way and, and really educated me in, in American culture and, uh, and gave me a lot of love and respect and support and a lot of lessons that are, that are with me till today. So I really felt that, uh, felt obligated, not obligated, obligated in a good way, um, 
felt pleasant to be able to bring Jimmy O, who's went through his hardships as an yeah. as someone who grew up during segregation and um, and grew up in New York City and seen different changes. He was an older guy, so I felt very privileged uh, to be able to bring this person who's had such a tremendous positive influence on my life to be able to bring him um, to to meet the president with me. Uh, because without him, I wouldn't be at the, at, the, at the point that I was at. So uh, yeah, both experiences really incredible, and uh, uh, and uh, and I'm very blessed that they happened. You, if you want to ask questions, I'm more than happy to uh, to answer them. Yeah, I, I, listen, I would, uh, I you know, I definitely want to stay on script, but I can't. I, there's no way we could pass that up. So we got, we definitely got to talk about that. So so you so you meet the president. What was the auspices of uh, how come you met? How can we get to meet the president, the president yeah. twice? Sure. So, so both times with President Bush, it was uh, the annual White House Hanukkah party. And they invite Jewish people from different areas in, in, I guess, in the United States from different, different professions. They invited me and with President Obama, it was also same type of idea. It was, I believe it was called Jewish Heritage Day at the White House. So, um, uh, both incredible uh, uh, opportunities and possibilities. And uh, really, I remember actually my graduation trip in public school, which is in fifth grade, was in Washington, D.C., and we got a tour of the White House. And, you know, and some years later, not that many, I got a chance to visit it as, a, as an official guest, which was, uh, again, as an immigrant who came here to be able to experience it is, 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 uh, is, uh, is uh, tremendous, and I'm very grateful for it. Wow, I, I'm I'm totally blown away by that. Um, you know, I'm kind of a, a little bit of a presidential historian geek, so that's uh, that's pretty neat uh, that you got to meet both of them. So, what was it like? I mean, was it the coolest thing ever? Were they super nice? Did Did President Bush remember you from? Because you said you went two years in a row. Did he remember you? I mean, uh, you had to be unique. I mean. He, uh, I, I, I don't know if he did or if he didn't, but we talked about boxing and he was very pleasant and it seemed like he, he, you know, he knew who I was. Uh, it was obviously, you know, when you're under, under so much excitement and pressure and, uh, you know, you, you forget a little bit of what happens because you're just, you know, you're in a moment, especially I was so young. So uh, I do remember that we spoke, we spoke about boxing, we spoke a little bit about what happened in Ukraine, about life in Brooklyn. Uh, and about coming to the White House and and all all of the presidents and all their the the uh, these uh, um, meetings were very gracious and very special and very memorable to me. Um, so uh, you know and and uh, uh, again extremely grateful for those opportunities and to be able to walk you know in the White House uh, different rooms and go in this room and go in that room. It's uh, you know it's it's. Uh, uh, mind-boggling in a way it was let's say let's see 13 years after i arrived to the united states yeah i'm, I'm blown away yeah I'm, I'm totally blown away by the story so yeah and uh standing in line you know you get checked first of all they, they you know they prior to you coming to the white house you they do a background check and then when you stand in line you know you go through these different machines uh it's pretty cool <laughs> that, that's outstanding that's outstanding Really, that's that's amazing. That's a that's a great story. Um, you, you know, so we were talking about you getting here. So you you joined the boxing gym. I would imagine uh, the boxing gym. You you wound up joining. I would imagine because you got in a couple of fights as a kid. Mm, yes and no. Um, when I was in the, in Odessa, because of I got because I was like kind of a weak weaker type of kid, and because I got into some fights, my father sign me up for the karate club and um and uh so i did that for for about a year before we left then i came here initially my parents didn't have enough money to send me to to to, to a gym slash dojo but then they did and they sent me to a place on bedford avenue and avenue x uh uh a sensei by the name of paul marmando mr karate usa who i uh, who i trained under and uh, he was a karate kickboxing teacher. And uh, he saw that I was, even though my parents only had enough money to pay me to go for go once a week, 
after a little bit of time, he saw how dedicated I was. He let me come every day. He let me come every day and stay for all the classes. So it was from six o'clock to 9 p.m. So for my kids, teenagers to adults. Um, and he saw that I had some talent, some combat talent. And my brother, my older brother, Michael, and he encouraged me to try boxing. And um, so it was a bit of progression. I did get into, into some fights and some, you know, some tense situations in, in, in public school, in junior high school, you know, because I didn't really speak the language well. I wore, you know, pay less shoes and kind of clothes that wasn't uh, cool, so to say. So kids picked on me and it's just part of, you know, it's just part of being a new kid on the block. And, uh, and it's okay. And I'm, you know, and, and, and I am now grateful for those experiences because they taught me a lot. But, um, and then I only knew about two gyms, Gleason's gym and Starry City. And Gleason's was far from my house. Starry City was also far, but it was a little bit closer. But most importantly is Gleason's was for pay and Starry City was for free. And uh, that was the, that was, <laughs> that was the decision that made me go, that made me join Starry City Boxing Club. And I remember walking in the Starry City first day, Starry City, Starry City Boxing Club was located in the basement of a parking garage in the Starry City section of Brooklyn. And uh, in it, there's no air conditioning and there's no heat and there's no bathroom and there's no running water. And um, I remember when we came there in the summertime, it had uh, so many, we'll, we'll get to it, but so many very talented fighters trained there. And when I obviously first walked in, I didn't know who was who, but I remember, I still remember it. And if if uh, we get one of those experts that can write things out, I'd be able to say who stood where and what happened because that atmosphere, my first day really stuck in my mind. And uh, something about it really inspired me to come back. And that's the first day that I met Jimmy O. And, uh, you know, and kind of the rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, you catapulted into a, a tremendous, you had a great amateur career and then, tra- you know, catapulted into a, a uh, tremendous professional career, uh, you know, winning a world title and then uh, winning other titles as well. Um, the, I, so the natural progression, you, you want to stay in the boxing business, you become a promoter because being a promoter is pretty freaking tough too, I would imagine. Well, you know, initially I started to promote, I, started, I got into promotion to promote my own fights and, you know, and then I saw business in it. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, uh, one of the first fighters I signed, the, sorry, the first fighter I signed is Jarrell Miller. And he, on his second professional fight, he fought on my shows and I recognized his talent and I really felt that he had the ability to be a heavyweight champion of the world. Um, so I, I, I recognized that there's a possible business in it and started to progress. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, here, here I am today, which is, you know, not, not so long after I made the decision to, to, to focus on it as a business. Yeah. It's about, it's what, nine years. It's been, I, you retired in 13. Yeah. I retired in 13. And, you know, initially we promoted most of the events that I promote, I promoted for myself. So they weren't really a structured business for fighters. And then in 2014, you know, kind of uh, recognized that this is what I want to do full time. And, uh, and we started to, to, you know, to, to, uh, to put things into play and, uh, and, uh, and really, you know, progress. And as you know, all startups are very difficult, uh, but, uh, but, uh, you know, and boxing is a very unique business and, you know, and there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, for lack of a better example, kind of the five families, you know, the, the, the top guys that have been around for such a long time. And when they see a new guy, they don't, you know, they usually approach you with aggression. And so, you know, when Jarrell Miller started to progress and really get world ranked and, and uh, get recognized, you know, different promoters wanted to take him away from me. Um, because here I was, I was in probably my early 30s. Uh, and they said, who's, who's this kid? How does he have this hot heavyweight fighter, you know? And uh, so everybody, everybody picked on me and, uh, you know, and everybody tried to enforce, uh, force themselves. But Many of the people that I've gotten into conflicts with as a result of that, I'm friends with now and do good business with, but it was a great learning experience and a great introduction into part of big time boxing for me. 
Yeah, if, if you don't mind, talk a little bit more about that. So some of the challenges, right? I, you know, obviously, uh, I, I wrote a, you know, I've done a, a lot of writing about boxing and, uh, you know, the inner workings still fascinate me. And I, I've always loved the sport, but I really love the business of the sport now um, as a subject. I don't know if I would be comfortable being in the business, but I, uh, I like writing about it. And, uh, but talk about that, because like you said, some of the promoters try to grab your fighters, like, what are some of the challenges that you see as a, as a promoter? Well, some of the challenge that I see now that's kind of the biggest challenge is exclusive TV networks. Yeah. It's exclusive, it's exclusive network deals for certain promoters. And, you know, uh, during COVID, as an example, there was only a few promoters that were in business. And I'm not going to name, they were in business, and I'm not going to name any, any names. Yeah, of course. The rest of the industry suffered. We had, there was you were not allowed to do events. You know you had you had so many fighters on their on their, in your stable that didn't make money. You know couldn't stay busy, couldn't progress themselves. So I would say the right thing to do would be okay. You know what we're going we as an industry are going through a hard time. Let's allocate and I'm just using a number, a hundred thousand dollars for each show, and we're gonna give you know we're gonna we're gonna pick five of the top promoters that don't have a TV network deal. And we're going to give them two spots a show just so that they can keep their, you know, so that would have been that in my opinion, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. I believe that as the leader of the industry and you want, and besides, I mean, it's obviously there's, it's normal to have self-interest and you want to make your business grow and that's normal and it's healthy and that's how it should be. However, there has to be a communal element of being able to give back to the industry and giving back to the business. Even if you may not like somebody and this and that, it doesn't matter because the global, the, the bigger picture is more important. And that's how you make the sport grow. So no one came and said, you know what? Uh, promoter A, B, C, D, here's $20,000. So you have a spot for two-year fighters or, what, or whatever it is um, so that you can survive. That didn't happen. And that's really, you know, it's bad. And I, I, I don't think that, um, I, you know, I don't, you know, tough, tough times bring out the essence of what it is. And I, and I really think that it speaks, doesn't speak so well of our industry. People that had relationships with other people, you know, it, it, some, some got to, to have some work, but it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be, you should not be discriminated based on your relationships. There should be some kind of a general, there should have been some kind of a general consensus to be able to allow promoters to survive. So, um, you know, thank God uh, we've gotten opportunities because of the talent we have. Um, and we work with everybody and have a good relationship with all the, with all the broadcasters and with all the promoters who have exclusive, exclusive promotional deals. However, when you have a top fighter, I'm gonna use Joel Miller as an example. And for him to, to, uh, to get on a certain platform, a certain network to fight a certain fight, you have to sign that fighter over to another promoter. Yeah, I know. That's, that to me is not fair. It is fair, it's in some, yeah. fair in some situations. So as a net, from a network's point of view, if, you know, some, once in a while, all you have is one or two fighters, right? And you don't have the foundation, you don't have the staff to be able to run events, to be able to, 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 you know, to really function as a business. So in that case, you know, the right thing to do for the network is that this entity as a promoter who is in it part-time they should have partner up with someone who's big, who's able to facilitate the network and all its needs in the most professional type of way. However, when there's a company that does things, you know, full time and is shown to be professional and to be consistent, you know, in that in that scenario, um, I really feel it's very difficult to take your elite talent that needs exposure, that needs to get paid, that needs big fun, and to um, and for this other entity who has a who has an exclusive relationship with the network just because, well, because of their hard work and because of their talent and because of whatever, but not doing anything to receive, not they have not done anything towards your business, you know, it's really unfair many times. And uh, and and there isn't, you know, and from a network's point of view, there isn't a structure to say, okay, we're gonna sign John Doe and you know, this is how it works. The promoters, you know, I'm not judging anybody. I'm just saying, I'm just, and I'm just saying how it is. 
will leverage the best deal they can get, which sometimes can be fair, sometimes not so fair, based on your based on your personal experience and expertise and et cetera, et cetera. So, but I really feel that for myself, with the amount of fighters that I represent and the kind of fights and events that we've put together, that it's it's really you know unfair and at times hurtful to our business. I I think the fact that boxing doesn't have some kind of national commission um, and it has the alphabet gang, I think that's absolutely harming the sport. And then the one thing, you know, the one thing about UFC, uh, and obviously I'm a boxing guy, right? I'm not a UFC guy, but the one thing about UFC is it's run by one person and they make great fights. So they put good fighters against good fighters. The, The stigma of losing a fight, uh, is not as big a deal because you you fight more often you fight often you know you get you get a lot of different opportunities you know I do think that hurts the sport because a lot of the matchmaking is is a challenge right um, I can imagine uh, the matchmaking is a challenge you know especially on the club level and then uh, the other challenges too is like you said you know you get squeezed by some of these other promoters the bigger promoters and you know it's it stinks it really stinks. Right. Well, I, I, you know, it, all the respect to Dana White, he's a genius and he, he really developed a new business that was never there before. And he's as great of a promoter as Bob Arum and Don King, respectively, although it's a different sport. However, the great thing about boxing, to some extent, is that if you have John Doe or Jane Doe and uh, one guy doesn't give you a good deal, you can go across the street to a different guy and, you know, you have four or five people. Dana White is one entity, more or less. There's... Bellator, there's PFL, but they, and they're climbing up, but the UFC is is at this moment in a league of their own. So when you don't have competition, and when you're the rank sanction organization, and the matchmaker and the network, you know it's it's a lot of power, and that's that's dangerous. I would not want that to happen in boxing. No, I, I get it. I definitely get where you're coming from. Well, um, sorry, it goes it goes. You know, there's like it goes. There's benefits to it, and I don't know if the benefits. I don't know which outweighs who, and, 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 and it's a bigger discussion because one of the reasons why the UFC was able to grow and be as big as they can be is because they control the environment completely and they have smart people, capable people that were able to make the most of it. I, I don't know how it would function in boxing. However, if Dana White wanted to get into boxing with his structure, he would be able to be a big player overnight. I really believe so. I mean... I believe that in a, in, a, in a fast amount of time, uh, he would be able to be a big player, uh, maybe even number one because of his structure, because of UFC fight pass, because of his social media presence, because of the great talented people that he has worked working for him and because they're able to tell stories like few people, like few networks can. Um, I, I believe that, that uh, Dana White as a promoter could be a real force in boxing. Wow. That's great praise. That's uh, that's really really good praise, and uh, it's cool. It's cool that you said it too, because you know some of the other promoters uh, that I know. If I if I bring his name up, they're like <laughs> they get they get you know. And again, I'm a boxing guy. I'm not a UFC guy. I'm not. I don't. I don't watch really watch MMA. Um, about you know, MMA is- but on a business, I watch and observe, and that's the truth from from where I, from from what I see. No, you're right. And look, the one thing, the one thing you're hundred percent right about um, is the money because look, I, I, I'll, I say this, I stand by it. You know, Anthony Joshua pays more in taxes than every guy in the UFC makes. Exactly. So, so that's the one thing. And, and when anybody tells me, Oh, well, you know, UFC's better boxing's dead. You know, I don't know. I saw Tyson Fury sell out nine, a 90,000 seat stadium. Uh, so that was pretty impressive as well. Um, I'll say yeah, that's that's you. If you watched Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder in the third fight, all of their fights, but certainly the third fight, the drama that a heavyweight, a bona fide heavyweight title fight between two qualified world class contenders, it, you can never mimic it in the MMA. The MMA is great, it's entertaining, they make combustible, bubbly, short, digestible things that are fun and that are like pop and that are cool, but. But the excitement and the drama of the back and forth of a heavyweight world title fight or any world title fight between two high-level dedicated fighters in their peak, I, th- I don't think that, M- that uh, the UFC or MMA 
can uh, can mimic that. As it relates as it relates to as it relates to uh, to fighters getting paid, you know, I saw Dana White. Uh, someone asked asked him about it. And he said like, okay, you want to pay people more? Okay, go ahead for me only. It's open business. Yeah. Open. Yeah. Start your own thing and uh, and pay them more. So. Yeah, so so you know, so right. Unless you can do it, it's hard to judge him. And he's obviously did a tremendous thing. However, if you if you put him side by side by boxing, in boxing, the A side fighter who draws the pay per view or the fighters together make 70, 80, 90, 95 percent of the of the revenue of the event. In yeah. the UFC, you no, know, it's it's it's. Uh, I don't think it's as generous. Uh, so, but you know, but at the at the same time, there's probably a bigger middle class um, in the UFC than there is in boxing. Although, although with all these new platforms uh, and new and and uh, content providers in boxing, I think fighters are making the most they've ever made uh, in the last several years. Yeah, and there's a there's a there's definitely a renaissance and a new demand for boxing. You know, it's funny something you just said about it, heavyweight drama and like. I, I like to pride myself on the fact that I'm, you know, I'm not prejudiced. I'm not really like, I'm, I'm not a biased person. Um, but I will tell you that I am definitely prejudiced and I am definitely biased towards the heavyweights. And as much as I hate to admit that I have, I have good friends uh, that are, you know, actually fighting in your, you know, fought in your weight class. I have, I love, I love the fighters, but you know, like, I'm not going to lie, like the, the, you know, the Kanachi fight, I watched it the other night. Um, I know Adam, I feel terrible that, uh, that he helped, you know, how he did. And then I, you know, I watched the, the zone, uh, cause I of course subscribed to the zone. I watched the, the zone fight. And of course I watched Chizora, um, you know, that I missed like about 10 great fights that I could have watched over the last couple of weeks, but I didn't miss either of those two with the heavyweight. So I might be a little biased towards the big fellas. Well, big guys that have skills and that are hungry and they're in shape, you know, there's really nothing like it. I, I think there's nothing like it in sports, really. That drama, yeah. a real bona fide world class heavyweight fight, is is uh, really incredible, no doubt about it. Yeah, you know, it's funny that so the time I had met you, the first time I had uh, gotten a chance to meet you was uh, uh, was Miller was fighting uh, Mariusz Walk, and uh, I, I saw him. Um, I saw him train. Walking. He was like watching a crane fight. He was like, he he was like the the whole ring, and he was like a, like uh, like a, watching a monster. So it was. Uh, so yeah, you, you do you do get a little drama. Uh, I can tell you this. I w- I could talk to you literally all day and all night. You're you're. This is awesome. I'm I'm grateful. Um, uh, you know, clearly you are tougher than life. You know. <laughs> you've made yourself a success you've uh you know and you continue to grow um the only question i have now for you is are you are you tougher than the, the fast five because i'm going to ask you uh five questions are you ready rock and roll all right let's do it who's uh we have to we have to do this one all the listeners always if i don't ask it the listeners get mad what's your favorite boxing movie rocky and and uh and I'm a little biased on Orthodox Stance, which is a documentary that was done on on some on some of my career. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, you know what? Too, we'll put that in the notes. Uh, we'll put that in the notes at the end for everybody to take a peek uh, a peek at that. I'm, I am I haven't seen it yet, but I am familiar with it, and it's uh, it talks about you know I know that you don't fight on uh, Sabbath and, and uh, the holidays and stuff. So um, definitely, we'll, we'll we'll put that in the notes for you. All right, good quick answer. Um, how about? Well, I don't know. The great, you know, it was a really funny movie, and and show some of the some of the lighter side of boxing is the great white hype. White hype, love it, love it. Uh, I, you're the first one who said it. One of my favorites. I uh, I talk about that with Joe DeGuardi all the time. I think that was. I think that's one of the the most truest boxing movies I've yeah, ever seen. No doubt. Yep. You know, it's funny. That was that wasn't a big hit either, and it has an amazing cast too, as an all star cast. I bet you if they were played and marketed today as like a new release, it would get a lot of, it would get a lot of uh, eyes and ears. Yeah. That's a, that's a great choice, man. I, I love that you said that. Um, and so, right. and, and Rocky three and Rocky four, but if we're talking about Rockies, Rocky three. And- All right. Good man. You didn't root for Drago, right? Rocky four. By the way, Roberto the Rand movie was good too. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Hands of Stone. That was, that was underrated. Yeah. I, we had Vin, we had Vinnie Paz on and uh, 
Yeah, you know, his, his movie, movie was phenomenal. Was, yeah, I'm sorry, I missed it. His movie was good. Shirelena's movie was, was good. Yeah, they're all good movies. Yeah, I like it. I like it. All right. Um, oh, sorry, what, sorry. There, there isn't one. They, they're all. Wait, they all share. They all share the number one uh, spot. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no worries. Yeah, I, I'm with you because they're like I'll I'll say the same thing. I mean, look, I think the first Rocky kind of is in a different. I mean, everybody in the world. I mean, I would love to know what the enrollment was at boxing gyms after the first Rocky came out because everybody wanted to be a boxer after that, including me when the first time I saw it. So, um, pretty cool. What's your um, what's your favorite restaurant in Brooklyn? Izzy Smokehouse in Crown Heights. Izzy Smokehouse, Crown Heights. All right, good answer. Um, if, name is if, if you like if you like me. I would suggest you go out there and check it out. It's very good. Yeah, I think I've heard of it. I think I've heard of it. I'm definitely going to check it out, though. And uh, Izzy the chef is a boxing is a boxing guy who works out at least three times a week. <laughs> I think oh, that's great. That's great. I will definitely check that one out. Um, all right, name a sport uh, that you could beat Otto Valine in. Well, I don't think I could beat him in boxing. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think so either, pal. <laughs> Um, Otto, by the way, what a great guy he is inside and outside the ring. I love Otto. Oh, terrific. Terrific. We had, we had him on also, uh, actually, thanks to you. We had him on and he, uh, he was great. Uh, told us this crazy story that, uh, some guys brought a, a guy on his bachelor party into, uh, to box him, which I thought was hysterical. Uh, yeah, he's a terrific guy. So, so what sport, maybe ping pong or, or, or pool or billiards, maybe. But I don't know how good how or not good Otto is. But oh, by the way, Otto's pretty athletic and he's a pretty worldly guy. So yeah. and, and in the peak of his career. So maybe maybe there's no sport that I would compete with Otto at this point. Well, look, maybe we uh, you know maybe we put some kind of deal together. You battle him out in ping pong, and uh, we can promote it. Maybe we do oh, that. A... All right, good stuff. All right, tell us the worst idea you ever had. Worst idea you ever had. Doesn't necessarily have to be boxing. It could be anything else. You know, m- most of my thoughts are surrounded by boxing. So, <laughs> um, the worst idea I ever had. <sighs> Let's circle back. <laughs> All right, let's go back. All right. Uh, can you tell us a clean joke? A clean joke. You know, I, I can't. I, it's it's uh, it's. Uh, I'll tell you this. I love Seinfeld. Uh, I, I, li- I like Kirby enthusiasm. Oh, I love Kirby. I love Dave Chappelle. Uh, and I love the Chappelle Show. So, so I guess I'm pretty worldly in uh, in in. Um, Comedy. Comedy well, but I like to listen more than tell. All right. Fair, fair point. We, I got to say, we stump a lot of people uh, with the with the clean joke. Um, well, you know stu- what? A dirty one would, wouldn't be any different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Except for Paz. Paz. Paz couldn't, we knew Paz could never get a clean joke, but we still asked him. But then he, of course, I, I said, look, if we did a dirty joke, we could do a whole we could do probably another two hours of the podcast. So, uh, so good oh, stuff, man. As long as you had your bleeper on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is explicit. So you can, you can, you're allowed to cuss on this. Um, well, listen, I, I really, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, this was tremendous. I had a great, this was a great experience and uh, I really am thankful to have you on here. Thank you. And uh, great honor to be here. And I want to end with how we started. You know, and I really, you know, I, I think about it sometimes, but I kind of th- thinking about it now as I'm talking to you. <clears throat> you know, uh, came here in 1991, again, just a kid from Odessa, from Odessa, Ukraine, from nowhere, right? From like the furthest place, you know, one of the furthest places from the United States. Welfare, food stamps and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, years later, I'm being interviewed by you. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and there's interest uh, and what I did for other people, which is like such a compliment. 
And so, and this is, uh, you know, part of the journey, part of the blessing of being in the United States of America, again, which I'm very grateful for. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for having me on and for listening to my story and for having this, uh, this uh, uh, conversation. And I look forward to coming back on with some great, exciting news. And oh, on, absolutely. On, uh, on, our, on our network deal and exciting things they're working on. Awesome. Hey, tell us where we can find you on social media. Dimitri underscore Salita. On Instagram, Salita, P-R-O-M. On Instagram, on Twitter, uh, check me out and uh, follow our company as well. Also, Detroit Brawl, both on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, also, our YouTube channel, Salita Promotions, is a very dynamic channel with lots of amazing content, original and uh uh, and some some historic fights as well, really fantastic. So yeah, I, I'm a I'm a subscriber. I uh, I'm a subscriber, and I, I I I when I was researching for the podcast, I definitely uh, I you know caught a couple of your fights. I watched some stuff on there, so it's pretty cool. Amazing, great. All right, thank you so much for having me, and and we look forward to being in touch. Thank you so much. That's going to be the final bell for today's podcast. If you like what you hear, give us a like and hit the subscribe button with your best power punch. You can check us out at Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you can find quality podcasts. We hope our stories inspire you to fight on. We thank you for listening, and remember, life's tough, boxes are tougher. Have a great week, everyone.